Shouts out to all the NFL that did not make our show. We still love you, though, baby. Lamar Jackson. They hey. two, two 2-0 with him as a starter. Running great, throwing yeah. pretty good. There we go. The Seahawks and the Panthers who seem to play every year. Way to go, Russell Wilson. Yep, Cam Newton. Yeah. Sorry I jinxed you. Yes, and also, North Carolina is, is apparently going to hire Mac Brown. I am so glad that you finally got to go on your crusade against Mike Brown. It's not a crusade against him because he still works here. Just saying. <laughs> I wouldn't have made that hire. Fair enough. There we go. First name, the Packers. Green Bay fell to 4-6-1 last night after Aaron Rodgers got outplayed by Kirk Cousins and the Vikings. Bo, who deserves more responsibility for this loss? Is it Mike McCarthy or Rodgers? Well, according to a character on a television show that you haven't watched to get this line, does everything got nothing to do with it? Does mm. Mike McCarthy deserve the majority of the blame for this? Doesn't matter when he's out of there, does it? They got a week schedule coming up at the end of the year, but it's hard to think that if they even if they went out, 9-6-1 and one is going to get them into the playoffs. That being said, the Aaron Rodgers that we are getting now, like this ain't the 2011 version of no, Aaron Rodgers. No. At his best, he still does amazing elite things. He also missed on some big throws in this one. Now, it was a party in the backfield because the offensive line wasn't doing a lot of favors and Minnesota brings the heat. Yep. But Aaron Rodgers, when we get to that throw to Devontae Adams late in the game, yeah. that throw was huge. That throw was big. That's the kind of throw that could have changed the game and given them a chance to win. Mike McCarthy didn't miss that. Aaron Rodgers did. No, and there should be two clocks that are ticking in the minds of every Packer fan as there we watch is. this very catchable or theoretically should have been catchable ball. Um, the two clocks are A, the one on Mike McCarthy, and we know how that's going to end. But the second one is on the body of Aaron Rodgers because the guy, as much as he is subscribing to the TB12 method, we know that he and Brady have been talking, trying to extend his career. He's turning 35 in December, and he was 17 of 28 for 198 yards. And when you get suboptimal Aaron Rodgers, it's okay to call it out as such. Mike McCarthy isn't responsible for every bad thing, even if he's not really helpful in this regard either. Okay, but here's the thing about Aaron Rodgers on bad wheel, right? Aaron Rodgers on bad wheel and Aaron Rodgers aging means something different than it might for some of his peers, like on the strata that he's on, because athleticism is a part of his game in a way that it is yes. not for Tom Brady, in a way that it is not for Drew Brees. Like, once those things decline, it matters more for the way that he happens to play. That being said, he is out here on a bad wheel, right? If the wheel is better, would he look better? It's fair to ask that. But right now, we got, you know, numbers on a card. He's 28th in the league in completion percentage. 28. Like right. a dude that we think of with his level of accuracy and his skill. That being said, he's great throwing the ball down the field. He's making the big plays. He's got more 20-plus air yard completions than anybody else in the league has this year. Hasn't thrown an interception on a 20-yard-plus air yard pass. He hasn't made any of those mistakes. But they don't look like a playoff team. And if they're not a playoff team, then who's going to take the blame for this loss? The dude that's going to take the blame for everything. The dude that's not Aaron Rodgers. And Mike McCarthy does not get any help from the economy of coaching that is surrounding him because it is, it is boom times for being an offensive-minded head coach in the NFL, for being a true play caller. And Mike McCarthy still, the criticism is still fair. He's not scheming guys open. We're watching him struggle to maximize a guy whose talent, to your credit, is unparalleled at the quarterback position. The problem is, why is he only trying to really make plays happen with Devontae Adams? Why isn't there someone else? Isn't that the front office at some point that should be brought to the table as well and not just McCarthy? No, but they have wasted the prime of the best quarterback of his generation. The thing is, you need to realize that a little sooner. Yeah. Right? It's a little late now to be like, damn, we wasted Aaron's prime. Let's get the most out of the twilight. Could have used him. Next name is Baker Mayfield. Browns quarterback tossed four touchdowns in a 35-20 win over the Bengals. And after the game, his recently fired coach Hugh Jackson, now employed by Cincinnati, wanted to come over and congratulate him. Classy stuff. Let's watch. There's Hugh Jackson. Mm-hmm. Goes for the handshake. Yep. Ooh. Ooh. In fact, I can't tell. Was Hugh going for the? Hugh was going for the. Yes, dab, he was. And yes, Baker he was. Mayfield gave him the soft spinach handshake. The disrespect. The only thing that would have been more disrespectful would have been the left hand. Now, after the game, Baker was asked about giving Hugh the cold shoulder. Let us listen. A classy gentleman, of course. Um, he said, "Good job, good game." Um, yeah, that was brief. I didn't feel like talking. Oh, okay. Me. I don't know. Left Cleveland goes down to Cincinnati. I don't know. It's just 
somebody that was in our locker room asking for us to play for him and then goes to a different mm -hmm. team. We play twice a year. What do you, Everybody can have their spin on it, but that's how I feel. No, I mean, it's just like any rivalry game. That's just how it is now. That's how I'm going to treat it every time we play them. But it's it's nothing, you know, there's no hate. That's just how it is. That's how I'm going to treat it. And I think that's how our team should treat it, too. Pablo, does Baker have legitimate cause to be upset at Hugh Jackson? No, but this is veteran savvy at the same time. He is turning Hugh Jackson into a useful traitor. They now have this figure to rally around against which is strange because Hugh Jackson is only in Cincinnati because he had nowhere else to go. Hugh Jackson left town because he was fired, because they kicked him out of town. And so if you want to hold the fact that Hugh Jackson would dare share secrets about your offense or whatever it was allegedly going to be with Marvin Lewis, I get it. But Hugh Jackson could not be lower right now at this point in time. He is seemingly somebody who could use any sort of empathy and gets the opposite. But I don't even think he's that Mayfield was worried about him trading secrets. Like it was just the idea that you went to go fraternize with the enemy, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, like this is ridiculous what he is ultimately saying. The basis of it. the thing is he's the guy that's driven by slights. He's yes. the guy that will go find them. Like it's a real Michael Jordan sort of quality, right? He is driven by slights. Therefore, this is the slight. This is a guy that used to be down with us and now he's down with somebody else and then he turns it into something. He went further later and threw the dig at Hugh Jackson and was like, yeah, now we feel confident in the people we have calling plays for us. And it's like, Hugh never actually called a play for you. That was Todd Haley. That was the one that was doing that one. This isn't intended to make sense. It's intended to make Baker Mayfield feel bad and then turn that into feeling good. And Hugh Jackson in this game, by the way, wasn't calling the plays either. He was standing behind Marvin Lewis like he was Marvin Lewis's stunt double and instead, in fact, came around to be the guy that everybody threw roundhouse kicks at instead of Marvin Lewis. And one of those roundhouse kicks, you might argue, was this play from Demarius Randall because... Oh, what a bad break for Hugh. That this interception had to happen directly in front of right him. Right there. Because as it happens directly <laughs> in front of him, that allows the dude to give you the ball. And give it to Hugh. He gave one on the helmet. Like, yeah. I, see, I see you, big homie. And he dropped the ball thereafter. But yeah. this is... Oh, this is a team that is looking for an identity. And they have found it in opposition to their former coach. Well, which is strange because, you know... The guy was fired, but hey, well, hold on. whatever. They didn't find an identity. That's an identity for a week. It'll be identity the next time they play him. They're not going into a game against the Steelers being like, we're going to show Hugh Jackson. They wish they could, though. Last day. Blake Bortles. After losing yesterday to Josh Allen and the Bills, the Jacksonville Jaguars have made some changes. Doug Marone has announced that Cody Kessler will start Sunday against the Colts. And this morning... They announced that they are firing offensive coordinator Nathaniel Hackett. According to Ian Rappaport, Hackett, quote, thought he was being called in to discuss a QB change. Instead, he was out, end quote. Obviously, the QB change happened anyway. So what is your reaction to this news? This doesn't make any sense now. Right now, it made no sense to fire Hackett at the expense of Bortles. And I imagine Hackett's frustration, where he thinks they're about to tell him that finally he can call plays with somebody other than Blake Bortles. He's like, nah, we about to be cooking with gas. <laughs> and they tell him no. We're about to be cooking with Blake without you. And then after they fire him, they say, oh, by the way, Blake Bortles is being benched. So whose fault are you saying that this is, that it's going in this way? If you think you need to check out another quarterback, why did you wait this long? The season, you didn't have to set fire to the season before you made any of these decisions. I don't understand anything they are doing right now. The best defense of what the Jaguars are doing right now is that they are finally recognizing who is bad at their job that they employ. Maybe they truly believe that Nathaniel Hackett isn't the answer, that the fact that he was running the ball so often, about 60 to 70% of the time what over the last you, two what games. What would you do? I'm not saying that it was do, the do, wrong do, strategy. Do, do, do you see, look at that right there. It's not you know, great. You know what they should have done right then? What should they have Call done? Call a run and play. But here's the problem, Bo. If you do not believe in Nathaniel Hackett, then yeah, I get it. Get him out of there. Maybe he's not the right chef for this kitchen with two weird ingredients. But the second thing you do, which is getting rid of Bortles, we were all calling for it. So my question simply is, if you are Tom Coughlin and you're trying to be preservationist about yourself, wouldn't you like be served to get like a week with Bortles and then play this as long as possible? Because getting this all done today 
seems like it's a bit too radical for his self-interested purpose. Also, go look at the quarterbacks that Doug Marone has asked Nathaniel Hackett to coordinate in Jacksonville and in Buffalo. Now, that Not being said, this team has lost six games in a row, and if you want to see the level of frustration here, let a Fortinet one fight somebody so bad that he ran 60 yards to do it. Now, this is one of the most hilarious plays I've ever seen because it's one of those simultaneous possession things. I never really understand how it works, <laughs> but neither one of these dudes is letting go of the ball. No. That's right. They laid up all on top of each other, yep. everything else. There's Fournette. He wasn't in the game, right? <laughs> and he's ready to go. Boom. The scrap happened. Carlos Hyde, who's also a stay-ready all-star. Look, dude, keeping in mind that Fournette Helmet's once on. was injured before a game in college, ran out to the fight before the game, then told coach, I'm playing, and 20 minutes later was out on the field in pads. Yeah, letting Fournette not necessarily the best judge of when to risk one's body, oh. but, but, Bo, they were still on the ground holding that ball when all this was happening. Yes. Just because yes. what else is there to do? <laughs> well, you don't I, really know what's happening. Just play it safe by well, gripping this. Well, what there's possible. not to do is fight Leonard Fournette. Coming up next, Cordell Patterson, why'd you put your hands there? Yeah. We got a shocker. The quarterback in Tampa this week did not turn the ball over. Huh. He also didn't go to college with you. But he did pass the ball to a guy I was the alum. Same school with you think Cam you, you think Cameron Braid. You shout think, out to you. You think you're fooling us with that reach, buddy? He is a wonderful tight end. First quote. You know, one of our tenets is protect the team. He didn't protect the team. And like I said, nobody is bigger than the team. Said 49ers general manager John Lynch when explaining the release of 2017 first round pick linebacker Reuben Foster, who was accused of domestic violence Saturday night. It's the second time since February. Let's listen. I think one lesson I've, you know, I've learned being around this league for almost 30 years now in different capacities is that nobody is bigger than the team. And that's ultimately what this decision came down to for us. Wow. Yeah, you know, one of our tenants is protect the team. He didn't protect the team. And like I said, nobody's bigger than the team and as talented a player as he was, as many positive steps as he was making, uh, we felt like this was the best decision to make. Bo, what's your reaction to how this went down? What the hell is he talking about? That, like, that is the immediate reaction. And the reason that I say that is everything that he said in that availability that he had with the media was all in these, like, cliche football terms. Like, he was talking about the way that Ruben Foster was maturing as this went on, as though this is an issue of maturity. Like, this is something that you just magically grow out of, right? And then right there, the, you know, this was about protecting the team. That's the issue? Like, that's what this comes down to right now is protecting the team. If the head coach said something like that, maybe I'd be inclined to listen to it and ride with it. You are the general manager. There's supposed to be like a bigger picture morality behind what these decisions are. And when the Ray Rice thing happened in 2014, that was our opportunity as an industry and around that sport to get some understanding of how these things work and correct some of the errors that we have made in the past mm -hmm. and the way that we evaluate these things. Instead, John Lynch is just like, hey, man, you messing things up for us when you go out here and beat up women. Now you got to go. Oh, how dare you endanger this for your football team? What? Your football team? Well, that's the strange part that I kind of credit John Lynch for. John Lynch, Bo, is derelict in his duty as a human being who is overseeing other human beings, someone who should have empathy for others. But as a football guy, he is being very upfront about what he actually cares about. And on that level, I do understand. You only care about self-protection. And that's what you said. You should care about more, but that's all you got? I guess so. You don't get credit for admitting to be terrible. But honesty is you something. You don't get credit for admitting to be terrible. He is Quote. Coming in, knowing that they've struggled in the secondary, personally, I would have loved to attack them, but it wasn't in our game plan. Said Odell Beckham when asked why the Giants didn't throw to him more during yesterday's loss to the Eagles. So listen. Should you guys have been able to exploit that secondary better than you do? Honestly, that, that's a question for coach. That's not really, you know, my kind of question. Um, I don't call the plays. I just do what I'm told to do um, and, and go out there and execute. Uh, whenever I get an opportunity to do something, I try and make the most of it. If I don't have that many opportunities, all I can do is, is do what I can when I do have an opportunity. So that's more of a question for coach, um, you know, coming in, knowing that they struggled in, in the secondary. Um, personally, I would I would have loved to attack them, um, but it, it wasn't in our game plan. So Translation, not my fault. Pablo, why do you think they didn't throw to Odell more? So speaking of people who cannot admit to being terrible. The New York Giants, they should 
not be trying to win these games. They should be tanking, they should be losing. I don't know if they're doing this intentionally or not, Bo. The reason why they're not throwing to Odell Beckham Jr. is a mystery. The reason why they're not running the ball more with Saquon Barkley after he has 100 yards and a receiving and rushing touchdown in the first half and gets five touches in the second half. Is it incompetence or is it actual strategy? They should be losing, but I just don't know if it's actually a strategy that they have. Well, the thing is they moved up and down the field in the first half, and then the second half was a completely different story. And Eli Manning, for the last three weeks, at the very least, has looked like a professional quarterback. Better. So you couldn't really get so mad at him for not throwing to Odell more in the first half because they were so effective in what it was that they were doing. However, man, the Eagles tried it out. I think their top three corners had one start combined coming into this game. This was not one where the Giants should have been avoiding the best player on the field. And that one guy with the one start, covering Odell Beckham Jr. Last quote. I'm a grown man. I don't need no one's ass and bleep and bleep in my face. Said Patriots receiver running back Cordero Patterson, explaining grabbing and squeezing the groin of Jets defensive end Henry Anderson. Let's watch what went down. This is crazy, man. Patterson. You ain't seen this? All right, so there he is right here. Cordell Patterson. Oh, yeah. Okay, I see why he was there. Let's lift that first. And there, there, squeeze, squeeze, squeeze. Like, you know how the squeeze got tighter and tighter oh. as he went off? Yeah, yeah. They Yo. finally got him off. And the Anderson dude said that he didn't even feel it, which, what? What does that mean? Should Henry Anderson accept the explanation that Patterson gave him? Because Patterson is saying, I don't need all of that well, up in here. I mean, I ain't gonna lie, man. I mean, I'm not really this type of person in a lot of different ways and a lot of different realms. But I feel like if I'm Henry Anderson, don't explain that to me. Go explain that to the police. Like what I think, I feel like what I witnessed there was a felony. All right, like I feel like that sort of treatment and being treated that way, that's something that you need to take up with, with law enforcement at that point. That, but, that's how I feel. But the weird thing is that Cordaro Patterson is in the sport where a bleep and a bleep and a bleep are going to be in your face a lot. Yeah, he had a butt uh, fumble, Bo, a butt yeah, fumble, a guy's but, face, but a guy's it, butt. It, it, wasn't a, it wasn't a linger. That's the one thing about it. He felt that that was a <laughs> linger. There's an understanding that there's going to be some drive-bys, but you're not just about to post up in front of the crib. This? Yeah. Coming up next, Jimbo Fish's nephew. Real bad idea. Ooh. Chris got to wonder what else he got to do to make our show if he couldn't make it after the last game. And you know what? He'll probably try. 20. Having another child. <laughs> Today's number, 53. That's the age of LSU analyst Steve Cragthorpe, who was reportedly punched after the loss to Texas A&M by Jimbo Fisher's nephew Cole. Cragthorpe said after the incident, quote, I didn't appreciate getting punched in my pacemaker. I'm not feeling good right now. I mean, I got nailed. He was a young guy. I'm 53. I'm not going to fight him. I have Parkinson's, end quote. Let's watch how this went down. He got punched in the pacemaker. Now, that gentleman in that white hoodie that was just taken away, that was Kevin Falk, who looks nothing like Steve Cragthorpe, just so you know. Uh, Kevin Falk's a five foot eight NFL running back for 13 years. You don't want those problems. That ain't stopped young Cole for trying to take him on. Now, Kevin Falk came to defend Steve Cragthorpe. Yes. Because Steve Cragthorpe had been punched in the pacemaker. Understandably, but this is one of those things that was the most euphoric moment. For Jimbo Fisher at AM, it's fair to say. And then suddenly, after this goes down and you see them being separated, you see many people justifiably angry. We have this video of Jimbo Fisher finding out that something has just happened to spoil the party. Yeah, I want to show you an important part of this video. I mean, they hadn't beat uh, LSU since they came into the conference, right? There's Jimbo. Yeah, oh, by the way, Unk. Uh, um, yeah, 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 me, yeah, yeah, that. yeah. That. And, and I felt like I hit something square in there, like it might have been a pacemaker. Electrical. And that look right there, that look right there at the end. You know what that look is? I give my, I give my brother's son from West Virginia a job, and he comes out here and embarrasses me in front of everybody. I can't take y'all nowhere. You had one job, and that job was to not punch the guy with Parkinson's in the pacemaker. For two different reasons, he ran up on the wrong dude. He ran up on the wrong dude in Cragthorpe because, again, pacemaker and Parkinson's. Yes. Then he ran up on Kevin Falk, the other wrong dude, because I did some Googling on him. That dude took a cop out in 1996. What? Oh, yeah, no, no, no. Does that, you like don't out, want, out to dinner? No, no, I mean, not out of, like, they had an altercation. 
Ooh. He ain't scared of you, little homie. Know that. I am very scared of him, though. In closing, I'd like to explain why I really need Oklahoma star quarterback Kyler Murray to remain a star quarterback in Bo. Today, Kyler Murray came out and said, I'm still going to go and leave football behind for baseball. Scott Boris and him have this whole plan. He just was phenomenal again this weekend. Four touchdowns, 500 yards of offense, just thereabout. But I did some Googling. Kyler Murray has something that is worth celebrating. Kyler Murray's mom is half Korean. And so this, because Bomani Jones, I need people to understand something. We, Asia, we need a quarterback. We really need a quarterback. We got baseball players. We got Ichiro. We got a Chu. We got a Hideo Nomo. We got all sorts of guys, but a quarterback is not what we have. And I need Kyler Murray to be that guy for me. Us. Asia. You're claiming every single one of them. If I can be confused for what you are, I am absolutely claiming you. In closing, I just want to mention that I'm from Texas. Now, the gentleman in this video, I don't know if he's from Texas, but this is why in Texas, you got to be careful about who you throw a surprise party for. Now, get on this right at the beginning. Don't wait to watch. Now, you may be wondering what happened here, right? You see the stuff falling from the sky? Oh! Yo! Oh! <laughs> oh! Yeah. And I believe if we let this thing play out all the way, many of you will have the same question that I have about him walking in and the way this plays out. Who are these white people? <laughs> Right? Like, what is the circumstance under which this dude is walking in the house with his gun out, putting it away, smiling at all these white people? I don't know. Highly questionable is next. Tell us if you.